Hi everyone, it's lovely to see you. Hope it's sunny where you are. It's absolutely gorgeous here. Um, and thanks so much for joining us today. We're really excited because we've got the brilliant Nay Hansel with us and she's going to talk about how to get ahead when entertaining. I mean, it's been such a long time since we've been allowed to have people over. And so we want to spend time chatting with them and hanging out with them rather than being kind of stuck in the kitchen cooking, which is where kind of cooking ahead and the freezer comes in. So, so much can be prepared in advance. Um, if you've got any questions as we go through, pop them in the comments box and we'll get through as many as we can. Um, and hopefully, if technology works, Nay will pop up any second now. Hello, hello. Hello, it worked. How are you? I'm good. I'm enjoying the sunshine. Isn't it nice to just be, so, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm so excited about this because it's been ages since we've been allowed to have parties or have people over and the gardens are looking so gorgeous now and it's just going to be so nice and um, so I'm completely out of practice I'm sure everybody else is the same and so you're going to talk us through the best practice for cooking freezing defrosting and reheating etc etc but you're also going to show us a few dishes is that right including yep. a ricotta um, galette is that how you say it is it a recording? Yeah, that's the one. Yep. Great. And also showing us some dishes you've made in advance and how to make them party ready. Is that right? Yep. Yep. Sounds wow. good. Brilliant. So without further ado, shall we start? Yeah, let's cook. Let's cook. When then we'll natter. Yeah. So I'm going to make today a um, butternut squash ricotta filo galette, which sounds a bit sort of glamorous and quite posh, doesn't it? But it's super simple and it's a really useful technique you can do for anything. Um, I, I love my freezer and I love my argo. I love the two together. And as Laura said, we've got loads of helpful tips to show you today, actually. So um, we'll cook this recipe. We're going to talk about lots of different tips and questions. And as Laura said, I've got another couple of dishes. I'm going to show you how to tart up, actually, having taken them out of the freezer. So let's make the, um, let's make the galette. So the first thing we need is a nice softened onion. So I've done that already. Um, as ever, in the spirit of all good cookery demonstrations, I've done a little bit of prep ahead. So in my, um, in the simmering oven, I've got an onion that I've softened actually. I've using, my pan's quite important today. I'm using a 23 centimeter um, cast aluminium um, pan. Um, a saute pan and it's got quite deep sides so I've softened my onion I'm going to add to it we'll pop it over, pop it onto the heat in a second but I'm going to add a clove of garlic don't tend to soften the I don't tend to cook the garlic when I'm softening the onions actually because it doesn't take nearly as long to cook so the onions you can do nice and slow I start them off on the simmering plate then I put them into the simmering oven um, my alga tops turn off they they're the fast heat up um, on off top plates which is an absolute godsend in this hotter weather because um, I can turn them off and I'm not using them. Um, or actually the other trick is if you don't want to be cooking on the top too much because the weather is hot, use the floor of your roasting oven as your hidden hot plate. So pop your onion in a pan, put it on the floor of the roasting oven, stir it a couple of times. Be careful because it'll be hot when it comes out. And then once it starts to cook nicely, put it into the simmering oven if you want it to take longer to cook, it'll caramelize nicely. Um, or you can just leave it on the floor of the roasting oven to cook. Or you can just do it on the top and turn it off. Cook in the kitchen, then run away. There's a lot of that happens. So I'm now piling in, you'll see quite a lot of spinach. So this is 250 grams of baby spinach. And I'm just going to stuff it into my pan because it's going to reduce to nothing. It's full of water. And we want all the flavor of the spinach, but we don't really want the water in it. So I've turned up my top plate. So I've got, as I said, I've got the two temperature top plate. It's been on simmering earlier on. I've turned it up onto boiling now. That'll take a couple of minutes to heat up. Um, and then it's going to wilt the spinach. I'll put my lid on. This pan is really good. It comes with a lid. Um, pop the lid on and that will get cooking nicely. So in the meantime, we'll do the rest of the tart and start to get that going. So it's butternut squash and ricotta. So we need our butternut squash to start with. Um, and the butternut squash, take a whole squash. Put it under here so you can see it. Um, and simply, I've trimmed off the ends and cut it in half. Um, and these days, I don't even bother to take the seeds out when I'm cooking it. Pop it into the roasting oven and cook it there for somewhere between half an hour, 45 minutes or an hour. When they are 
um, when they're grown in the winter and then stored, they'll take longer to cook because they've sort of got higher kind of dry matter content. Whereas in the summer, when they start to become freshly harvested, they won't take quite so long to cook. And you'll see that with quite a lot of vegetables. So pot that. You can, I think I used to brush them with a little bit of melted butter or some oil or something, but I don't anymore. The, the radiant heat from the roasting oven just cooks things like this beautifully. It cooks it all the way through so it's really tender. It'll color it slightly on the top so we get that nice flavor from caramelizing. So that goes into the roasting oven. And then when it's cooked, it can come out and it looks like this my chopping board so because we haven't taken the seeds out yet we just need to take the seeds out and you know they come out a lot more easily when they are cooked than they do when they're not cooked um and like i used to I used to peel a butternut squash with a peeler and cut it up into chunks before I cooked it, but they're really hard and that's quite hard work. It's much easier just to cook it. The skin is actually a really nice color. I've got, and you want that color because you want the flavor. So then just take a nice sharp knife, cut it into cubes. And you want cubes maybe like one centimeter size, um, but it's not totally important. You can cook, you can do this bit in advance. Um, I did this bit yesterday, actually, so this has been cooling. You could probably freeze a whole squash if you wanted to. And if the odd seed goes in, that's fine too. Now, do what the food stylists do and keep a little bit back. That goes for all your ingredients because you'll see why in a minute. So keep just a few little bits of that back. Perfect, right, we'll come back to the squash in a second. Now, the next thing we need is the filling. So that was the butternut squash bit. This is the ricotta bit. So we want a tub of ricotta. Ricotta is lovely. It's just a sort of curdled milk, really, actually. And you can make your own. Um, it just needs just mixing, actually, to be honest. It's got about the same fat content as, like, full-fat Greek yogurt. So it's quite healthy. And if you're wanting to keep your quiches and your tarts and things a bit lighter, instead of using double cream or things like that, it's a nice way to do it. So it doesn't taste of an awful lot to start with, so you definitely need to season it. So that is some salt, pop in a good table, that's a good a half teaspoon here, some salt, some freshly ground black pepper, lovely. Then we want uh, the zest of a lemon. Lemon and ricotta is a real classic filling. It's used a lot for um, uh, tortellini and those lovely filled pastas, you know, um, raviolis and things would just be a mixture like this actually. Uh, ricotta seasoned with lemon and salt and pepper and mixed in with some wilted spinach. Now, let me just see, give my spinach a quick stir and see how it's doing. Good. So just mix it over so that the onions on the bottom begin to just mix through. You can see how much that has reduced. Um, and we're aiming to get rid of as much of that water as we can. Um, if you're using frozen spinach, which is totally fine as well, just defrost it, um, either at room temperature or in a pan, actually nice and hot, just put it into a pan and just mix it until it defrosts. Um, cook it until it's got all the water has gone and then even squeeze it out with your hands um, or put it onto a piece of kitchen paper that will absorb any remaining water. Right, so that's lemon zest. The juice has got another purpose in life. I'll see you in a minute. Um, and then some Parmesan cheese. That does two jobs. That does a nice sort of saltiness and a tastiness as well. So that's, that's the base of my filling, actually. So in a second, we're going to have our spinach. I'm going to mix in the squash. Remember, I've kept a bit back. It doesn't really matter what order you do the squash and the spinach. Don't overly mix it because you want you don't want the squash to disintegrate, but it's nice, it's roasted, it's gonna hold its shape, but it's not gonna be too squishy. Right, let's have our spinach. There we go. In an ideal world, it might have had longer. So if you're making this yourself at home, <laughs> just move my pile of steam. Um, if you're making this yourself at home, cool this bit down before you add it to the filling. Um, what I'll do with this just now, and this is a good tip for any sort of freezer cooking, is 
put things, to cool things down, take them out of the pan or the dish they're in because it'll be hot and cool it down. Spread them out onto a tray and you'll see how much quicker they will cool otherwise. Right, so my pan is dual purpose today. So wipe it out or give it a wash because we're going to use it to assemble our tartan. So this has got a really, really good non-stick lining. Um, and if we make frittatas and omelettes and things in it, we don't even have to use any oil or butter. The things just slide straight out. So there's my tart. Right, let's put that aside. I'm going to get the phyllo out and we'll talk the pastry bit of this. So phyllo pastry is, it's really nice actually. It's just a bit lighter. Um, it doesn't have it doesn't have any butter in it. That is a thing. So you've got the floury bit, and you've got a little bit of oil normally, but not very much. Um, and it comes um, ready prepared like this. You know, you can make your own phyllo, and that is definitely fun. But it's a it's a job for for a fun day. And when you roll it out, what you do is you roll it so thin that you can read the newspaper through it. That's a test for a good, really good homemade phyllo. Um, but I've bought it, and I would suggest you probably do as well. You can buy it fresh, you can buy it frozen, you can buy it and you can fresh and you can freeze it. And it's a great thing to have in your um, in your freezer as a little standby ingredient. So for Unfold It, it comes, different brands have different numbers of sheets and slightly different sizes, which can be slightly tedious, but don't worry. So with this one, I've got seven sheets in the packet, which is really annoying because I really wanted eight. But what I'm going to do is I'm just I'm going to trim a bit off the end, but you don't have to. We'll do something else in a second. That I'm going to tell you about if we get a moment. Um, so and then I only want four sheets of this. I think that's fine. One, two, three, four. It's lovely and soft. You do hear People saying, oh, cover it with a damp cloth so it doesn't dry out while you're using it. Well, to be honest, it's not really going to. We're not going to take very long. Fold that up, put that bit back in its packet. And I often put that bit back in the freezer, actually. It hasn't been out. It hasn't. It's been this hasn't been frozen yet anyway. So, um, right. So then take your sheets of phyllo. Take some melted butter. I can shut my top now. I've finished with the tops now, so I'll turn it off. And actually, that's the secret for keeping the kitchen cool in the summer is don't lift the lids up more than you need to and turn the tops off if you can when you're not using them. So take a little bit of melted butter. This is 25 grams of melted butter. And I'll try and give you the quantities as I go along. But Georgie will no doubt post the recipe um, on the Facebook page once we're finished, actually, once I've finished correcting all the little errors and spelling mistakes that end up in recipes so brush that with a little bit of melted butter then we're going to use this my pan to cook it in because i do quite like not having to use too many bits more bits of cookware than i need to so take the sheet of phyllo um the first one i know that's fine right pop it down like that and squash it all the way in do the same. It's quite therapeutic doing dishes like this, actually, where you have a little bit of brushing. And I think if you're making a dish um, that needs a little bit of work and a little bit of concentration like this, it's great if you can do it and then put it in the freezer so that when it comes time to uh, put your party frock on or put the parasol up outside and actually get on with the business of having people around and enjoying their company, um, you're not then thinking about the detail of like, how do I follow the recipe? So that is definitely a top tip. So then just move that so you can see it slightly. Second layer and just press the layers together. Then do the same with the last one. Last bit of butter. It's only 25 grams of butter. It's not actually very much, but you can, do you know what is really, really good to use is those spray oils that you can get are amazing. I've melted the butter on the back of the agar or you could do it in the warming oven if your tops are off and the agar's completely cold. Um, but uh, the spray ones are really good as well, actually. Three, last one. We'll get Laura back in a minute. This will be in the oven in a second and then she can come and give us. Um, and so if, as Laura said, if you have any questions and any tips or any sort of queries of can I freeze this or that, please do pop them in the comments because then we can help with as many queries as possible today. Right, last one. So I've overlapped them. I've got bits hanging over. Right, so here we go. Move my chopping board. Da, da, da. So take your filling, which was, remember, the butternut squash, 
the ricotta. Um, add the now cooled spinach. You could chop the spinach just with a pair of scissors if you wanted to as well. That would be quite handy. Mix that in. And then in it goes into my tin dish. If you were making this and you weren't using the pan to make it in, you can just do it free form actually. So lay the pastry onto probably the cold plain shelf would be the best thing. Um, line it with a piece of bacon lid just to help keep it clean actually. Then um, put your filling in just in a, like a 20 centimeter circle. There we go. Now fold the edges in. So remember we talked about keeping a bit back. Okay, that's important. Um, I've got two more things to add at this point. Um, some pine nuts. These are delicious. They're quite expensive, actually, so don't use that many. Um, put them near the middle because that bit's going to be open and we'll toast. And then a few of these bits that I kept back, I'm just going to pop in the top. And they will help it to look pretty. There we go. Fold in. And you don't, you're not trying to cover the top. We want a bit left open there we go you can sort of just shape it a bit if you want to um, take the last little bit of melted butter and just brush the tops that will help it color again if you've got the spray oil or spray butter just give it a little squirt that's a, it's really good for phyllo actually that stuff there we go right so that is going into the oven so i'm going to bake that in my roasting oven that's where we do pastry the roasting oven is the hottest oven on the Arga. It runs at about 220 degrees and it's really, really super hot. So we use it for roasting potatoes, roasting chickens really quickly, roasting vegetables like the butternut squash, jacket potatoes in an hour. Um, and we use it for pastry. And what's clever with pastry is often we cook um, like a short crust pastry tart or a puff pastry tart and we can cook it directly on the floor of the oven. Um, and it cooks the pastry from underneath while it um, cooks filling on the top. So you don't have to blind bake the pastry. Um, so there's no danger of any soggy bottoms on the pastry itself. Um, if you've got ovens with fast heat up ovens, so if you've got an ER3, an ER7, um, or your oven, or an Arga 60, or if your Arga came with a floor grid, that's a very flat grid, put that on the floor first. Today, I'm going to cook mine on my grid shelf on the floor. So it's about an inch off the bottom, so that the filling cooks nicely from underneath and so that the pastry cooks on the top, doesn't brown too much. This one, don't put it too near the top of the oven because the very thin phyllo will catch quite easily if it's too high up. Um, we'll, we'll put it in for half an hour and then we'll have a look at it after about 20 minutes. Um, and I might slide the cold plain shelf in above just as a heat shield if it needs it. So in it goes. Um, and then Laura, no doubt, is gonna reappear and ask, ask me any questions you might have asked and we can talk about all other things, Freezer. Hey, wow, that looked absolutely delicious. I'm always a bit nervous about filo pastry, but you made it look really simple. Um, as Nay said, if you've got any questions, pop them in the comments box. Um, but I have lots, um, some that were coming in advance and oh. some of my own. Um, so, I'm, uh, so what freezes particularly well, would you say? So I think, so pastry dishes, as we've said, actually, like uh, phyllo pastry, puff pastry, tarts, all those things, whether they're cooked or whether they are uncooked, actually. Um, so main dishes, you know, the classic family favourites like lasagnas, shepherd's pies, fish pies, all of those that you've made. Um, and you can either freeze them uncooked, so you take them out and you cook them, or you freeze them completely cooked, so they're ready just to thoroughly reheat and cook again. Um, almost cook again, I suppose. Um, so main dishes, side dishes, actually like roast potatoes are brilliant. Cook them, roast them, freeze them, and then just give them 20 minutes in the, hot, in the roasting oven to perk up, they are brilliant. Yorkshire puddings, all those sorts of things we wonder about um, in the winter as well. Um, side, other side dishes like cream spinach or vegetables or pasta freezes well, pasta dishes, cook pasta dishes in sauces. Um, make them slightly more saucy than you might do normally. Um, and then desserts, so tarts, baking, cakes, pastries, and actually uncooked cookie dough, as well as ready cooked, ready made, finished cakes. Great. And what can't you freeze? Um, not many things, actually. So things with a really high water content. Uh, so fresh fruit and vegetables, you know, strawberries, delicious, fresh, but put them in the freezer. And what happens is all their little water molecules just freeze and burst. So when you defrost them, you've got strawberry slush, which is lovely, but not necessarily what you wanted. 
Um, and again, fresh vegetables. So we tend to blanch them. So part cook them first. Okay. Um, weirdly, whole eggs don't freeze awfully well. I don't know why. Um, and emulsified sauces like mayonnaise don't, they just split out. Um, egg whites, having said that, do freeze tremendously well. So if you've got loads of eggs left over, um, break, the, you know, crack them, freeze the whites and use the yolks to make ice cream. Perfect. Brilliant. Um, and how should you package things for the freezer? Um, so the, 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 the holy grail, actually, you know, the, the very, very best way to do it is to vacuum pack things in nice flat bags because you don't get any freezer burn around the edges because everything is totally sealed. Um, but tightly packed otherwise, um, or in boxes, actually, I like to use because square things seem to make the best of the space that's in the agar as well. But make sure things are quite well wrapped. I often do a lot of what we call open freezing. So I'll take a little white tray and I'll freeze things uncovered to start with. And then when they're all frozen, because they're not quite so delicate, I can put them in a bag, um, like chunks of cookie dough I do like that, or raspberries I do like that. Um, and then you freeze them individually, so you can just take a few out. Okay, so uh, is that so as not to damage them, but also so they don't clump together? Yes, and then you can use part of something. Um, it's good to freeze things in portions, actually. You know, if you've got a cake, cut it into slices, and then you can just have two or three slices or as many as you want. You don't have to then wait for a big occasion to defrost the whole cake. And that's often how people's freezers get clumped up with. Uh, you make a large size of something, you don't use it or plans change, or you had one as a spare, as a backup, or you had a bit of crisis of confidence about having frozen it, um, and you end up with a whole cake. So portion everything definitely that makes sense and what about cookware is there so i absolutely hate washing up or dishwashing um so <laughs> is there cookware you can cook something in squeeze it yeah, in, so, squeeze it in. yeah so there's some great things actually what shall i show you first um in a minute we're going to tart up something that's come out of the out of the um so yeah let's do this one um so the arga have this amazing range of um uh, it's called kind of fire and ice. So there's an agar by, there's Port Merion agar and there's Spode by agar. Um, and the, there's baking dishes like these. Um, that's, a, that's a normal size baking dish. Let me show you something. We're going to use one of these in a second. We're going to show you something I've made in one. Um, but they go from the, they're deep enough to make a nice tartar or quiche in. Um, they can go from the freezer to the oven, to the table, to the dishwasher. And you can cut them with a sharp knife. So if I made some brownies or something in this, I could use a sharp knife to cut them. I wouldn't have to worry about having lined it first or taking the dish out to then cut it up. So they're really useful. That's that's the normal size one, half size one. So you can get two of those side by side in the agar. But what is really fabulous that I totally love and it's a bit like my partial dress, you know, to be fair, or my floaty caftan that might come out. So this is the large size. So this is the full agar size. So if I was making a tart in this, I would make two and a half times the recipe that I put into the small one. But this would serve, you know, 24 nice size portions for a dessert or something or as a quiche. Um, but the whole thing can go into the nice wide drawers on a freezer as well. Um, but that this material is lovely and it really, really lasts. It's really hard wearing, actually. And I love, as you say, the fact that it goes in the dishwasher. If it gets super grubby, you can scrub it with the back of an on-scratch sponge as well. Brilliant. And so are you going to be doing loads of anything in the garden once you're allowed to have lots of people around? <laughs> I'm probably just going to empty my freezer, actually, and go, oh, what should we have today? Yeah, so this is particularly when you get the odd moment, it's, or in the evenings, or if you're making one batch of something, make two and put one in the freezer. So whether it's like a family lasagna or whether it's something a little bit smarter for um, entertaining, then yes, yeah, definitely. Great. Um, and are there rules for how long different types of foodstuffs can be um, stored for? Because well, I, re I don't really freeze very much. What I find is that I'll freeze something. Six months later, I'll find it in there and think, oh, I have no idea whether this is okay or not. And I never remember to write the dates on either. Yeah. Um, so on the whole, most things you can freeze for at least a month, if not two. Um, and there are lots of good guides on the internet of actually particular how long could I could I store this for? But, you know, really, I've never come across anything that I've taken yes. out of the freezer and it's been unsafe, actually. It'll just start to look, depending on how you package it, start to look a bit sad around the edges. But often things can be tarted up quite nicely um, and revived. But, uh, yes, certainly a month, most things 
definitely two months, most things two months, um, and lots of things a lot longer. And how do you guard against freezer burn? Um, I think wrap things well is the thing, as you said, um, vacuum sealing is amazing, actually, because that takes away all of that problem. But make sure you just wrap it in a couple of layers of grease with paper. Um, I've seen me wrap, I've seen me wrap bread in tea towels, actually, uh, in the freezer. It's quite a dry, you know, the freezer is a dry environment compared to your fridge, which is a slightly wet environment. But just make sure they're packaged around the edges. Um, plenty of sauce as well. If you're freezing a casserole, make it a bit more saucy than normal so that you've got sauce to cover all of the meat. If you've got meaty bits poking out the top, the danger is they might sometimes get a little bit freezer burn. So plenty of sauce um, and things nicely wrapped. Okay, great. And do you have any go-to cook and freeze and advance party recipes? Is that, is that anything you do every time? Yeah, so I think if I'm doing family stuff, I'd be doing, you know, the lasagnas, those sorts of baked dishes. Um, if I'm doing something slightly more fun, I often do nice stuffed chicken breasts, you know, some flavoured little crumbs, wrap them in some bacon or pancetta, and I freeze those raw, put them on a tray, freeze them raw, and then once they're frozen, I put them all in a bag, and then you can just take them out, um, cook them. So instead of taking maybe half an hour, 40 minutes to cook in the roasting oven, I'd give, I'd give them an hour, um, but cook them in quite a small dish, so the juices that come out, you can then use as a base for a little sauce, or just warm up some stock, soften an onion maybe, stir in some cream, bring it to the bubble, season with salt and pepper, and there's your nice sauce. So that's quite a nice one. Um, but for this sort of weather, what I love to do actually is to take something like a butterfly leg of lamb, either that I've had to butterfly or I've got the butcher to do, marinate it in some nice cumin and cardamom and um, coriander and those sorts of kind of Middle Eastern spices or like a Moroccan spice rub. Um, a little bit of lemon, maybe a bit of olive oil, marinate it in, a, in, a, in a, a bag and then put the whole thing into the freezer. So that actually when you want to come to cook, all you have to do, you don't have to worry about any of the slightly messy stuff, just take it out of the fridge, uh, take it out of the freezer, defrost it either in the fridge um, overnight or at room temperature during the day. And then you're ready to either fast roast in your aga um, or to cook on the barbecue outside. Okay, great. That's um, if I'm and if I'm doing puddings, I would be doing either a meringue, a nice meringue roulade that I can make completely and freeze completely ready to, ready to serve. And if I'm really clever, I might slice it up. I wasn't sure how many people were coming. Um, or cheesecakes is the other one that actually freezes beautifully. So a cheesecake or a tart um, or a meringue and then either a lamb or a chicken or something more family friendly like a lasagna. Great. Um, and Lucy's just asked, do you cook chicken from frozen? Do you, do you cook the chicken from frozen? Yes, those little chicken breasts like that, I would do, actually. They don't need... What you want to make sure is that things are properly cooked through. And the best way to do that... I can demonstrate. So you take a nice sharp knife, OK, with a point, and you point it into the middle of the food that you've cooked. And you hold it there while you can't show about four. And then you take the point out and very carefully just hold the point flat <laughs> against the inside of your wrist, which is a very sensitive point, okay? But very gently just hold it. And, and if you can still hold the knife against the inside of your wrist, it's not hot enough and it's not cooked inside. So you want that knife to be like, oh, that's hot. And that's how you test things on the very inside or a skewer or something like that. Or you can use, you know, use a temperature probe. They are brilliant. <laughs> Yeah, a little chicken breast, I would cook, to, I'd be totally happy to cook on its own. I wouldn't cook a whole chicken raw from frozen in the agar. I would let that defrost thoroughly like we do with turkeys and things as well. Brilliant. And um, how do you make the most of space in your freezer? Yeah, square containers. Um, milk cartons, actually. Milk cartons for stock. Tall things and square things and bags. So it depends on what it is, but yeah. Um, and make a list, actually. Some people keep a list on the outside of their freezer, and that's a really useful thing to do. Just remember to score things off when you take them out. But I mean, I'm a bit of an accountant, really, when it comes to it. So I often just make a list of everything that's in the freezer, take it all out, work out what meals I'm going to use it for. Um, and I tend to do that sort of about now when we're having a big change of season from, um, you know, it'll be the end of term soon, it'll be the holidays, so we're going into a different kind of eating. And I do that in the autumn as well, but, you know, when we go from everyday autumn eating into Christmas party mode. It's a good idea just to have a thorough sort out, um, have a few eating up meals and then restock with useful things. Makes perfect sense. And um, um, do you have to wait for food to cool before you freeze it? 
Yes. Yeah. Um, those little a tray. You spread things out flat it makes things cool down fast. Um, if you've if you've got some leftover rice and things, put it onto a tray, cool it down really quickly, and then you can bag you can freeze it on the tray. Once it's frozen, you can then bag it up. That sort of thing is useful to do. But yes, make sure things are cold because your freezer will get confused if you put hot dishes in. It'll raise the temperature of the freezer and it confuses everything else that's going on. So put things in fairly cool, um, definitely. Brilliant. Any other questions? Do ask away. Um, what about leftovers? So things like, I don't know, carb or when you've got like a little bit at the end of a bottle of wine or you haven't used all the stock or, or any of those things. Do you do you kind of do the ice cube, cube tray thing or? Yeah, the ice cubes and things are really handy to use. Those um, muffin molds and things can be good or just actually little pot like leftover pots. Um, it's really good to reuse things, but if you've got things you've bought in in semi disposable dishes, you know, use them to freeze things in too. Um, as I said, milk cartons is a good one. Um, but yes, I'm a bit inclined to throw in anything that's left over, and particularly if I buy a beautiful or I make a beautiful loaf of sourdough bread, um, don't we don't always get through a whole loaf? So actually, I tend to cut it into four, keep a quarter, and freeze the other three quarters separately, so you can just take out a small bit um, and just use that nice and easily. Yep, all sorts of things are leftovers, but make sure you label them um, so that you know what you've got. If you've um, frozen sourdough, do you revive it in the agar before you eat it? Yes, yeah, sprinkle it with water, five minutes in the roasting oven. Yeah, or even if you've got bread that's a bit stale looking, actually, that's a good tip too. Brilliant. Um, breads, breads in general are brilliant, actually. All of those, um, you know, whether it's bread or whether it's pizza or flatbreads or part-baked croissants, part-baked rolls or ready-to-bake croissants, all of those make brilliant staples. Because your agar is on, or very quickly on, depending on which one you've got, you can literally take it out of the freezer, put it into the oven, and you've got the smell of beautiful, freshly baked croissants wafting around the kitchen in the morning before anybody's actually out of bed. So it's a very, I tend to have a shelf that's for bread type things, um, and it's either things I've made, um, or it's part baked things and that's just handy to have a stock of actually so any you know I grew up my mum would always have the part baked pretty pan so they always appeared with whatever cold meat from the Sunday roast was um, along with some freshly baked bread so the warm bread and the cold salad makes such a nice combination and that combination of, of you know temperatures makes you feel like somebody's really thought about what they're making you yeah that, that's absolutely true and so if you're going to be if you're going to be doing a big party um presumably in the garden because it is so gorgeous right now um do you need to press your dishes before you reheat them or yeah what are the rules because obviously you said the chicken can what else can you cook from frozen and what else do you need to defrost so i was trying to work out how to make how to kind of explain this because you sort of do it intuitively so i think that the best way i thought to explain it was defrost it at the temperature you are going to serve it at so so the, the like the health safety health food safety advice says defrost everything in the fridge but that can take quite a long time and be quite dull so if you want to serve so if you've got a salad you're going to serve cold like coronation chicken that i've got to show you cleverly in a minute um I'm going to serve that cold. So I'm going to defrost that in the fridge and it's going to take overnight to defrost. If I defrost it at room temperature, it would take about six hours to defrost. So my tart, actually, if I, which, which um, once we baked it, we can um, freeze it, cool it and freeze it completely. I'll open freeze it because the phyllo is quite delicate. But once it's frozen, I can then wrap it. Now that I like to serve warm. So I would defrost that either in the warming oven or in the simmering oven where the pastry is not really going to cook anymore. It's just going to heat through properly and do the heat through test to make sure you're happy that it's thoroughly defrosted and nice and warm in the middle. If I've frozen a casserole, I want to heat, I want to eat that hot. So actually I could, if I wanted to, I could put it straight into a hotter oven, maybe the baking oven, the moderate oven, um, or the simmering oven to heat through. And then I would put it up into the roasting oven to get thoroughly heated and give it a good stir to make sure it's fully heated through. So I think that's my rule of thumb for defrosting is the safest place to do it is always in the fridge overnight and that's just in case you forget and leave it out but if i'm serving whatever temperature i'm serving a dish at i would defrost it in that bit of the agar great that makes perfect sense and so you said you wouldn't cook chicken from frozen is that just because of the intricacies of the shape of it 
The whole chicken, yeah, because they get totally cold and frozen inside. You know, you when you defrosted a little chicken, you want to make sure you can wiggle its legs and they move nice and freely. It should feel, I mean, we I would always bring a chicken to room temperature before I cook it anyway, because it seems to cook more evenly. It doesn't take quite so long. Um, but make sure it just, and pick it up, because it makes sure it feels like it's sort of floppy a bit as well, actually. If it's still quite rigid, it's probably still frozen. You just have to give it a bit longer. Great. Right. Brilliant. Um, you've mentioned tarts and cheesecakes and things. Are there any other puddings that you are a go-to kind of freeze in advance? Um, brownies. So all the baking type things, actually, which, uh, you know, tarts or brownies. Um, ice cream, obviously, is the one. Um, <laughs> I think that's, yeah, what else do I make? Fruit, even just... Um, if, if all you've got in the way of fruit is frozen raspberries or frozen black currants or something and you're going to defrost them and they're obviously not going to hold their shape, just whiz them up into your puree. You know, squash them with a fork or whiz them up a little bit um, or with black currants, just bring them to the boil, simmer them for five minutes or so until they burst in a bit with a bit of sugar and some water um, and then strain them through a sieve and you get these lovely kind of coolies or compots and that sort of thing. And then just spoon those, serve those slightly warm over nice cold ice cream or with black currants you can just do it even with icy cold double cream and a little shortbread biscuit on the side sounds delicious what's your favorite do you have do you have a favorite pudding laura if you have something in your your freezer box what would it be well i don't really tend to freeze very much so i've learned loads today and i shall be freezing more often uh, my favorite pudding is literally anything with chocolate in it um can you make, <laughs> can you make ice cream without an ice cream maker Yes, easily. Um, do you know, there's a really famous Delia Smith recipe, which I think loads of people already know. And it's a carton of whipping cream, a carton of creme fraiche and a tin of condensed milk, a bit of vanilla essence. Whip it all up with a mixture until it's kind of slightly fluffy and put it in the freezer and freeze it. And I lived on that for years, actually. Uh, and then I got an ice cream maker and that changed my life. Um, other things, you know, ingredients are handy to freeze. Like if you've got bananas looking a bit sad and we've all been making banana cakes forever, but you can fr just peel them and freeze the bananas and then you can whiz those in a like little powerful food processor just with some ice cubes if you wanted to or just the bananas on their own or with a bit of cream if you wanted or a bit of coconut milk and that they make it well, like an egg white makes it nice and fluffy as well that makes a good um dessert instant fairly instant dessert from the freezer um and crumbles actually as well of course crumbles you can freeze make the whole thing and freeze it um, but you can also freeze a crumble topping. So I tend to think, oh, I've got a few sad bits of rhubarb in the fridge. I'll chop them up, put them in a little mini gratin, mini little ramekin dish, um, sprinkle over a little bit of sugar. It's normally 10% sugar. So if I've got 50 grams of fruit, I'd have five grams of sugar. If I've got 400 grams of fruit, I'd have 40 grams of sugar. And then a couple of spoonfuls of crumble topping straight from the freezer onto the top of the crumble and into the roasting oven to bake for maybe 15 minutes for a little one or half an hour for a bigger one. Fantastic. Um, so, and, and that was all great. I learned a lot. I am going to get, I'm going to use my freezer more, definitely. Um, now you're going to show us how to present a couple of previously frozen dishes, aren't you? Because it's all very well cooking them and freezing them, but you, need, well, you want to make them look party ready. Exactly. It's a bit like us. You know, we might have the best outfit in the world, but if we forget to put our lipstick on, we don't quite look ready, do we? So um, here's the first one I've got. So this is coronation chicken, um, which is a slightly unlikely candidate for freezing, I would say. Um, but the thing with, so with mayonnaise, we've already said we can't freeze mayonnaise very successfully because it will split. It's an emulsion and it'll just split out and no amount of stirring will bring it back together again. So um, what I've done is I've made my coronation chicken with a roast chicken that I cooked in the arga cooked it in the, in the simmering oven. So start it off the roasting oven for half an hour and then in the simmering oven for maybe it was like a couple of hours while I remembered. Um, and what happens there is all the, all the meat on the legs and the thighs actually goes really succulent and really juicy and comes away really easy. So I then use the whole chicken, cut it up, let it cool down and I've mixed it with my dressing. And my dressing actually, instead of having mayonnaise, has got full fat Greek yogurt and full fat creme fraiche those two together make a really nice quite light dressing actually but it doesn't split out so this one I've had frozen in a little box um, so I'm going to tip it into um, this is the Arga gratin dish and this is I could have frozen it in this dish actually I don't really know why I didn't to be fair um, 
And this is one that goes from the freezer to the oven, to the table, to the dishwasher, to everything. And it's perfect. It's nice for doing a serves for lasagna because it's got straight sides. Um, it's nice for doing a crumble. It's nice for doing a tiramisu. It's nice for serving vegetables in. And you can get three of these into the Arga ovens, one behind the other. So that's my, um, that's come out really, really creamy. We'll let you have the recipe so that um, Georgie can pop it up onto the Facebook page. But let me just do a bit of tarting up for it. Um, the, first, the first way to tart things up is always to use, always to garnish with ingredients that you've got in your dish. So in my dish, I had some apricots. Actually, I wonder if I do it side by side like this. There we go. Uh, I had I used some chopped dried apricots, and these are quite nice because these were actually still um, quite soft. If they ever go a bit hard, just soak them in a little bit of water um, while they cook. So garnish some of that. I could have kept some of the leftover chicken. Remember, like we did with the squash, we said we keep some of that leftover. Um, another thing to garnish with, I've got curry powder in here um, mixed into my dressing. So garnish with a bit of curry powder. I could blob some plain yogurt on the top would look quite pretty. Um, so, so that'll give you a whiteness color and then you could put the um, spice on the top, that would be nice. So I'm, what I also want to do is add a bit of color. Um, you could use an avocado. This is a really good tip actually, Laura. So if you've got your avocados and they are ripe, once they're ripe, you can peel them and put them in the freezer. And then you've got ripe avocados ready for whenever you want them. So that would be nice to do, to fold through. Um, Spring onions, so something nice and green is really nice here, actually. Um, so just a few spring onions. It's really important that when you're cooking, people walk into your house or your kitchen and they can smell things. If they can smell freshly chopped herbs or if they can hear the clinking of glasses, all those are little, little sort of subconscious prompts that there's something delicious happening here. I'm going to have a really lovely time. So a few of those, we'll move the rest of those. We don't need those just now. Some spring onions for color. There we go. Um, we could have some flat leaf pasta if we wanted to. I've got some coriander. Coriander is quite nice. Because you've got something kind of Indian, you could have, if you had any naan bread, bits left over that were a bit sad you could just make them cut them up into little croutons or crumble or some crumbled up um mm, crumbled up poppadums would be good remember we cook poppadums directly on the boiling plate on the agar turn them over with tongs and do it pretty quickly if you've got on off top plates you can turn them down a little bit just to take the heat off um and the final thing that i quite like with this actually is some of these nigella seeds so these are nigella seeds are black onion seeds and they give you another color another little bit of contrast in color so they are good and then my last one to show you for this dish um, is some toasted almond flakes. So I just toasted these on the simmering plate on a piece of bake lide. And now I can just tip them into a little dish. There we go. And they've got a lovely color. That was nuts are quite tricky to toast, actually. So do them on the cooler heat. So a few nuts through there. So that's my coronation chicken looking much more exciting than when it first came out of the freezer. But the important thing with that is to make a dressing that's not going to split so you don't get that wateriness. Um, I froze it overnight and it would have been happy in the fridge for a month or so at least. And then I defrosted it. It would either be in the fridge overnight or at room temperature for about six hours. But you want to serve this cold. So don't let it get warm room temperature. You want it only just defrosted. Stir it through, taste a piece of chicken and make sure it's fine. So that is that one. Um, I've also got, let's do this one as well, um, for something sweeter, um, remember tarts are, tarts are brilliant for the agar actually because they cook so well. So we cook them without blind baking, we cook them directly on the floor of the oven. I've got a half size agar port marion here and what I've done with this is I lined it with a piece of short crust pastry. Um, I took a tin of apricots because actually apricots are here, but they weren't quite ripe enough. I took a tin of apricots and I used those and some blueberries as well. Um, so this is quite an interesting lesson, actually. So when you're baking things in your agar, we had something else going on in the oven here at the same time. Turn them round halfway through cooking to give you really nice, even baking. That's a really good agar tip. Um, and you, that gives you a chance to open the door and have a look um, at what you're cooking. So to make the tart look prettier, so you could serve it like that, that would be totally fine.
But again, take the ingredients that are in the tart. So I've got some apricots and I've got some blueberries. We'll put it onto this little dish here. I've also got, um, I've roasted some apricots as well, actually, because that really helps to bring out the flavor, particularly at the start of the season when they're not looking quite so glamorous. So again, I use one of these half size gratin dishes just to roast a few. And they've been sat in the warming oven to stay warm because I want nice warm apricots with my warm tart and my cold cream. So the tart, if you want to, if you want to heat it, if you want to serve it warmish, defrost it in the warming oven or in a simmering oven will be fine. Um, then take a piece out. I portioned this, so I cut this into eight pieces before I froze it, knowing that it would let me take a piece out at a time. So there's, we'll do a couple of squares on this tray. We'll make it, make it fun. There we go. A couple of those, I um, can probably show you. See, they're really good. You get a lovely, nice bake all the way through. So that's my part. Then serve it with just a few sort of tarty up type things. Um, I've got some mascarpone cream, which I love. It's got a longer shelf life than double cream. Um, just open the tin, the um, tub, and give it a little stir. If it's very stiff, then you can just let it down with a little bit of milk which I might do actually, because I want it to be what they used to call dropping consistency, didn't they? Where you want it to just be able to fall off the spoon a little bit. And that depends a little bit on how warm or cold it is. Um, so a little bit of something creamy. So my tart would normally be warm actually for this, or certainly room temperature. Let it defrost at room temperature so it's nice and tasty because cold food never has as much flavor as warm food does um similarly very hot food doesn't either actually so just give this stir until it's picked up a bit so then a little blob either on the edge or on the top of each bit would be nice there we go um some of my roasted apricots Would be good. Uh, put them on there. You don't need to always do lots of something, is the other thing. You can just roast a few things. Um, with apricots and summer fruits and things like that, what's nice is just to glaze them with a little bit of apricot jam. So that's apricot jam just warmed on the back of the argo with a little bit of water if you want to. Oops, I've lost one, I've had a slight capsicum. There we go. Um, again, a few, a few more of the things that we, we baked it with, a few blueberries would be nice. There we go. Um, if you want a bit of extra color, the reason I've got this here is I've got some pistachios and they've got a really nice bit of colour you can just slice them up with. So a few little pistachios for colour possibly on that one. Or actually some of my toasted almonds remember would be nice on this because you've got almonds. Um, and it's good to garnish things with the ingredients that you've used because it gives people a clue as to what's in it, particularly if you've got things like nuts going on that people would have, might have allergies with so put things and chilies put things where people can see them you glaze the tart itself would be a nice way to just perk it up there we go uh, then finally most commonly magic ingredient for tarting anything up um, dessert wise would be some icing sugar actually so just a little dust Uh, and then actually, you know, sometimes if we're not concentrating and things get slightly overcooked at the edges, a good sprinkle of icing sugar on the edges just to cover up all of those little indiscretions. So that's tarting up my tart. Um, and it's nice to have, you know, if you've got little bowls with some extra fruit, um, it's nice to serve those as well. Some people might prefer just to have fruit. I think if you can serve some fruit and some cheese and some berries, then everybody is everybody is covered. So that's those two tarted up. So talking and put them around this way. I'll move my camera up, you can see well. Um, 
and in a second we can have a look at see how the tart is doing so i think that's cooked actually so there you go laura those are my tips for tarting tarting up your tarts um let's take out the squash tart and see how it's looking it's made a presentation so important isn't it and it's really great to sort of see see it done properly so the tart i quietly slid in the um cold plain shelf actually because the tart had cooked on top nicely and that's a really good tip actually if you've got my camera organized today there we go if you've got your tart if anything is browned on the top but not cooked through put the cold plain shelf in above it and it'll just act as a heat shield so there is my lovely tart and that will just i'm going to let it cool in the tin but it will slide out really easily, actually. I can tell the filling's all cooked because it's nice and bubbly. Um, and when it's cooked, it then looks like this one. Or more to the point, you know, when it's cooked and frozen and defrosted. So this one has been completely prepared in advance. It's been into the freezer. I didn't cover it because it was quite brittle, but if I, if I was going to leave it in the freezer for longer, I would do. So just simply take it off its dish of its cooling rack you'll get a few crumbs of filo around but that's okay and again just a bit of tarting up of the tart but this time we'll just have some herbs i think um and give those a little chop great absolutely great and that's all it needs actually really so yeah Fresh herbs, as you say, though, if you can freeze the things like fresh herbs that you don't use, you know, that's handy as well. But just all this one would need. Serve this tart warm, it will taste the better for it. But just actually plenty of fresh parsley. Um, and we're good. That looks fantastic. Um, uh, the recipes for this, are you going to post them? No, are you going to send them yeah. and post them? Yep, yep. So we'll let you have the recipes for the tart, which is super simple. Um, and it can be used if you wanted to have a completely vegan one. Quite a lot of the phyllo pastries are vegan, actually, if you read the instructions, the ingredients carefully. Um, and if you obviously use oil to line them with, that's good too. But you could, in the filling, because we baked it in the pan, actually, what's good is you could have a slightly runnier filling. So you could have um, a tomato based one, maybe with some aubergines and things in it, um, or just some tomatoes as a galette is lovely. So lots of things. Um, so yes, that one. And then the apricot and blueberry tart will post. That's got a frangipan filling and the coronation chicken with its magic creme fraiche and Greek yogurt dressing. Perfect. So we shall all be garden party ready very soon. <laughs> Thank you. You've been amazing. Um, don't think there's any last minute questions for anyone, but we will be posting the recipes. And yeah, thanks so much. Hope you have a very lovely day and hope everyone has a lovely sunny day too. Yep, great. Nice to see you.